Hey Technostads, in this video we're going to take a look at how computers work. We're not going to take a real deep in-depth discovery over computers and how they operate, but I want you to get a, give you a brief understanding of why these binary numbers are used and why we talk about them so much. So let's take a look at computers and how they operate. We're going to start this video out by talking about the history of computers. We're not going to take an in-depth look, but just see what the progress was and where we're at right now. Then we're going to take a look a little closer into digital, digital circuits, what they are, and why they use bits, ones and zeros, to be able to calculate information. Then we'll take a look at a few different representation of binary numbers or how ones and zeros, how these bits get translated into graphical representation or how they get translated to get computed. We're just gonna take a glance into those different aspects of how a computer works. So we're gonna roll this way back to 2400 BCE where we have the abacus. Now the abacus is contributed to being one of the first computers. It computed, although very manual. It was a, some sort of board with beads on it that you would scoop back and forth to calculate some sort of uh, you know, addition and subtraction, some simple calculation. So that was contributing as being one of the first computers. Obviously didn't have all the electronics that we have now and the, didn't have the speed. It was a very manual process. Now fast forward to 1820 and then became the idea of having some sort of machine actually do the calculation. So it is a little more automated of a process. There are still a lot of manual components where you had to physically alter some sort of input into this machine. And then there would be wheels and gears and pulleys that would then calculate to have some sort of output from that. So Babbage was one of the first ones to come up with this concept of using machines for calculation. And so we had machines start doing our calculations physical machines. Uh, then we started coming up with things like vacuum tubes. So in 1934, the idea of using vacuum tubes came about where now, rather than a mechanical process to do the calculation, a mechanical computer to do the calculation, perhaps we could use electricity and, and create faster compute power with this. And so they started out using vacuum tubes. We don't need to necessarily know all the ins and outs of how these vacuum tubes work, but at some point in time, they transitioned to using vacuum tubes to using transistors. Transistors are interesting. They use something uh, called semiconductors in order to turn these little switches on and off. And then you string these little transistors all together to, to create a chain for calculation. So these transistors were starting to be used then at that point in time. In 1961, then came the integrated circuit. The idea behind integrated circuit is, is that now we take all these transistors and we put them all together on some sort of microchip or some sort of uh, little circuit circuit board or we put them really close together and so we can start minimizing how big and how much electricity these computers would use. And since then, we've just con continued to get smaller and smaller with these transistors, trying to make the transistors just atoms thick. And so that's kind of the, the, the general progress of the history of computers. And now we have these integrated circuits that we're using. As these integrated circuits got smaller and smaller and smaller, at some point in time, they became microprocessors. So a little bit of a history around microprocessors. So in uh, 1975, one of the microprocessors that we had was this MOS 6502. Uh, it was one of the best performing ones at the time. It was later used in the Nintendo Entertainment System. That one had 3,500 transistors in it. So you, you can see that I mean, that's quite a bit. Although as you're, as you're looking at this table, you realize that we really expand quite quickly when we move to the 1978, the Intel, 
8086. The 8086 had 29,000 transistors in there. The Pentium Pro, which I actually had a chance to work on before it was released into the public, was really cool experience. I'm so glad I had that experience and be able to work on that. But the Pentium Pro had 5.5 million. As you can see, it just continued to grow. The PlayStation 2 in 2000 had 13 million. The Xbox 360 in 2005 had 232 million. And then the <laughs> this uh, Apple M2 Ultra has 134 billion transistors. So these little transistors get shrunk down to, to just being microscopic. And uh, these, if you look over here, this picture that I have right here, these are chips right here. So, and this is how they are created. They're created on these wafers and then later they are cut out. So each one of these is a chip right here that they would then cut out, test for the speed, and then be sold at a certain speed out on the market. So uh, that those are the chips that are created now and you would have millions if not billions of little tiny switches, little tiny transistors on these uh, on these uh, uh, wafers here on these each one of the integrated circuits, each one of these microprocessors. So these millions or billions of transistors that are on these microprocessors nowadays, uh, there are little switches. A transistor is either a one or a zero and you have some support, sort of input into it and based off of that, you get an output from it. And depending on how and what order we put these different transistors into, we can get different functions out of it. We can store data with it. We can store, uh, we can process, we can calculate data with it. We can present data with it with it. We can do all of these things with it, which is amazing. It is crazy that we can do that. But we all we do it all with these little ones and zeros. Ons or offs. A one is an on, a zero is an off. A one means that there's voltage coming out of it. Maybe it's five volts, maybe it's a half volt, maybe it's 12 volts, just depends on the integrated circuit that you're using. Or it doesn't have any voltage, it's a zero. And so these transistors are uh, little switches in there and that's why binary numbers come up in so many of our calculations when it comes to computers. One representation of that is we type out text. We have text on a screen. And so we need binary numbers that represent different letters. So if you were to look at the binary representation of the character A, it would be 0100001. But we can't forget lowercase as well. And that's a different representation. So a, a lowercase a is 0110001. So then we need to also represent all the numbers. We need to represent all the, the other characters on the keyboard. We need to represent. So there's different things on the keyboard that we have to represent that we want to represent and send codes back and forth. So your calculator, when you press an A, that will translate it to 01000001, it will send that code to your computer, to your processor, and that processor is going to determine what does it do with this A that you typed. Well, it's going to depend. If you're in a game, that might make you go left. If you are in a, uh, in a work doc document, that might type out a letter A on the screen. So it's going to do different things uh, depending on um, what exactly application that you have open. Not only do we need to represent characters that we type out on our keyboards and into our spreadsheets, but we're also going to need to represent graphics. There are things that are displayed to us. So how do those graphics get turned into little ones and zeros? Well, here's an example of it. I've got a little Mario here that's a, a little simple bitmap here. And for each of your colors, here, then you're going to have a certain amount of red, a certain amount of green, and a certain amount of blue. And so we're, you know, if you just wanted a really bright blue, you wouldn't have any red, you would have no green, and you would just have straight up blue. But most of their colors are out, out there are going to be some sort of variation of a blue. And that's where we, we actually have some red, some green, and 
all blue right there. All those ones means that it's all blue right there. All right, so for every single uh, bit that we have in here, then we need to calculate how much red there is, how much green, and how much blue there is. And depending on that and this little character that we have right here, we've got a four colors that we're representing here that get put into there. So uh, this one right here, so this square right here is going to be represented by three bytes as well as this as well as this one, as well as this one. So you could take three bytes and multiply that by how many pixels you have on here to determine the size. And so uh, there are ways to compress it and there's other ways that we can store some of this information. So I don't wanna get too much into that, but you can see that these numbers right here are representing the component, how much red, how much green, how much blue there is for every single pixel there is on this graphic. So that's one way that we can store information and present information, how a computer is going to do a graphical processing on it and then send that signal to your monitor and your monitor is going to display it. And it's all with these ones and zeros. By the way, one thing I can do is I can take these binary numbers that I just showed you and I can translate those into decimal numbers. So it's anywhere from 0 to 255. So 255 means that it's maxed out. You can see that the blue is maxed out right here. And you can see the elements of how much blue, how much green, and how much red is in here. And if you wanted to convert that to a percentage, I guess, you could just take 255 uh, or take the number that it is divided by 255 and that would give you the percentage of each of those. So it's 100% uh, of it is blue there. Now, I would love to go in depth into how computers calculate information and how, what, how transistors, what they look like. It's really not necessary for this course, but at some point in time, I'm going to offer a class on that. I think there is some value in understanding that, but it's not really necessary to understand IP addresses. So uh, let's take a look at a full adder and what a full adder is. And it's just for adding two numbers together. So let's say I'm adding a one and a zero together. I use something called gates here, and we see a couple XOR gates, we can see a couple AND gates, and we see an OR gate. So we use these different gates to calculate the number and have some sort of output. This is the carrier in right here, and this is the carrier out. You don't necessarily need to know what that all means, um, but I just want to give you a, show you how a computer would really just add two numbers together. And if you want to add uh, you know, more, like let's say there's um, multiple, uh, uh, it's a very long number that you need to add together, you would just create more full adders and put more and more full adders. And then each one of these gates has quite a few transistors involved in each one of these gates. So this could be just the simple little full adder could have 20, 22 um, different uh, transistors in it to calculate and add just two binary numbers together. So it really is uh, <laughs> why we have billions of transistors in today's microprocessors. Um, but this just gives you a concept of how a computer will add be a, a basic calculator and add numbers together. And really what it's doing that is it's doing a lot of calculations on the different bits. That's what the processor does. It computes and it's processing that data and it's doing uh, a lot of times it's mathematical equations on that data to get output from that. So that is how a computer works. All right, in this video, we talked about the history of computers and how we've gone from this abacus to more mechanical to electronic signals. And we now we use transistors and we pack those transistors into smaller and smaller microprocessors. And that's getting into small little chips and we're getting them atoms thick now, which is amazing. And then we showed you some different binary representation of how a computer takes those ones and zeros and is able to process those ones and zeros and then be able to send data to your screen, would be able to accept data from your keyboard. So it's really fascinating at how these computers work. But what that all boils down to is computers use ones and zeros. They store information using ones and zeros. And 
to understand ones and zeros is going to be uh, fairly critical to being able to subnet. So we're going to get more in depth into uh, binary numbers and how to manipulate and use those binary numbers. <laughs>